Space aliens took my baby. Grandma swims Atlantic Ocean. Bill Belichick to the Chargers. Now, all of that, in case you didn't know, is what's called clickbait. It's something, something that comes across your screen, and they just want you to click on it. It's really no truth to it. It's just trying to get your attention and get you to get sucked into reading something. Sadly enough, many people think if it's on the Internet, it's real. Oh, you didn't? It's not, okay? I'm sorry, I just... Santa Claus and Internet, they're kind of the same level, all right? Okay, at least Santa Claus is based on a true character, okay? We sometimes need to be skeptical of what we see in the newspaper or the Internet or in a book or on the news. We don't know what to believe sometimes. Well, that's very much the purpose of the book of Luke. It's to help people know what they can believe in both in the theology and in the practice of what a Christian is to look like. So the book of Luke uh, doesn't open with clickbait. It doesn't open with some little catchy phrase to kind of suck us into reading it. Instead, it opens with the first four verses that are like a, 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 a stone entry into a, a museum that's got information and facts in it. By the very introduction, you can see it's a solid piece of research. It's serious literature. And for the first century uh, Mediterranean world, when they would have read this, they would have realized that this wasn't fable. This wasn't a a fly-by-night, a casual writing. This was serious literature that they needed to read seriously accordingly. So let's look at Luke chapter 1. The first four verses introduces the book. It says this, Luke 1 verse 1. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. It also seemed good to me, since I've carefully investigated everything from the very first, to write to you an orderly sequence, most honorable Theopolis, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. The first few verses of Luke tell us something. We're going to be studying Luke uh, throughout this year, and so we need to have a good basis for the study. And if you look at those first few verses, I want you to notice it says, tells us at least three things, just kind of introducing the book to us. First, it tells us that several others have already written on the same subject that Luke is writing about. That's verse 1. Those others would be Mark and Matthew for sure. Maybe John writes before Luke. Probably not, but at least Matthew and Mark have have written before Luke writes his. Secondly, in verse 2, it tells us that the writer was uh, interviewing eyewitness people to assist him in his research. So he is not an eyewitness observer of the things he's writing, but he's talking to people who are eyewitnesses. Thirdly, in verse 3, it appears that the writer has listened to some credible teachers from local communities, and he's gathered their accounts to uh, write in his book that we know as the book of Luke. Now, this is important because what happened in that day, they didn't have printing presses. They didn't have the internet. Uh, And so what they would do when when an event occurred to people in the town who saw the event, they would get together and they would share their story. And as they were sharing their story, they would come to a consensus that this was what happened. And that information was given to the storyteller of that community, of that town, of that city. And the storyteller's job was to keep that the story of that event alive and to tell that story whenever the opportunity came. And uh, whenever he would tell the story, there would usually be people in the audience that had heard the story before or had been at the event itself, and they held the storyteller accountable to be sure it was the correct information. And Luke, in all his traveling, he's heard different stories about the life of Jesus, and he is assimilating them in this book that we have called the book of Luke. I need to uh, just kind of pause here from our study from Luke and give you a little bit of explanation on what is expository teaching. Uh, For the most part, 
I preach what is called exegetical, from an exegetical study or what's sometimes called expository teaching or expository preaching. And so every so often I explain to you what that means. It's not the only way to preach, and some people would say it's not even the best way to preach, but it's primarily the way I preach. You can preach thematic. Sometimes I preach thematic. I intentionally force my self to preach in ways that are not comfortable for me because it's good for me to do that and it's good for you to hear different styles. So a thematic way of teaching is what I did for about 10 weeks on Wednesday nights when we covered the topic uh, answering difficult questions about God. You know, we just came out of that in, on Wednesday nights. That was a thematic study. Really wasn't much of scripture involved. It was more of an apologetic approach and more of a theme approach. Another way that you can preach is you can preach character studies. I like to do character studies. In the summer, oftentimes, I'll do a character study. Since I've been here, I don't know, I've done David and Joseph and Moses and, and uh, Joseph and, and uh, Paul and uh, uh, characters of the church. I've done all kinds of character studies. I usually do those in the summer. I like to do those. But my favorite way of preaching is expository preaching. And expository preaching means you take a passage and you let the passage expose the information to the people. You don't have an idea in your head and say, okay, let me find a verse to match that idea. Expository teaching is you let the Scripture say whatever it's going to say. And so sometimes it'll hit people between the eyes, and some people will step, sometimes it'll step on their toes, and sometimes it'll make them feel good. It's whatever that paragraph says, that's what you preach. And so primarily that's what I do. In 2023, we studied Ephesians. Now, I did give you a little break, and I broke it up in four different series. I didn't just go verse for verse through the whole thing. I broke it up and did four different series. But by the end of November, when we finished the last of those four series, you had studied every paragraph in the book of Ephesians. That's expository teaching. The year before that, we did Psalms. Now, we didn't cover every paragraph in Psalms, or we'd still be on it, but we covered a lot of it. And we've done all kinds of uh, books that way. We've done First and Second Corinthians that way and so forth. Well, in 2024, we're going to do the book of Luke. And before you do expository preaching, you do what's called, this is technical term for us, an exegetical study. And all that means is there are certain things that the, the teacher does to prepare to present to the listener and there's some questions that you ask of a book. So today, I am going to present the answer to those questions. It's not really a sermon as much as it is a study. So you'll know for the rest of the year, whenever you approach the book of Luke, you'll know the background behind the book of Luke. You'll know what's going on behind the book of Luke. So that's what an exegetical study is. And the first question that we ask is this, who wrote Luke? Now, you may think, well, that seems to be pretty simple. It's Luke. The only problem is, is Luke never, it's never stated in Luke that Luke wrote Luke. So we need to spend a little time talking about who wrote Luke. Most people don't realize that the writer of Luke and Acts, which here in a minute I can show you that that's the same writer, that the writer of Luke and Acts wrote more verses in the New Testament than any other writer, more than Paul. Actual verses in Luke and Acts, written by the same person, uh, there are tw uh, 2,157 verses between those two books. While Paul wrote 13 books in our Bible, he has 2,032 verses, so about 115 verses less than Luke. John, who wrote the Gospel of John, Revelation, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, only has 1,416 verses, so Luke and Acts have a lot, they cover a lot of material in our Bible, so we, we need to spend some time on, on those books. Also, few people realize that Luke is not directly named as the writer of Luke or Acts, neither, neither one. He's, he's not directly named. But there is some evidence that we need to consider that would show us that Luke probably is a good candidate to be the writer. And so let me give you three, uh, just three things to think of here that, to help us see that Luke might be the writer. First, Luke and Acts were written by the same person 
And that's based on the introductions of the two books. Now, I just read the introduction to the book of Luke. Now, let's just go over to Acts. Uh, you're handy in your Bible on a Wednesday night, so just go over to Acts chapter 1, and let me just read the introduction to Acts chapter 1. Remember in Luke chapter 1, he's writing to Theophilus, and he's, he's gaining information from eyewitnesses' accounts. He's gaining information from other writings. He's interviewed these people from, from cities and so forth, and he's writing about the life of Jesus. Okay, that's in Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. Now, Acts chapter 1 says this, I wrote the first narrative, Theopolis, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he was given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles uh, that he had chosen. So this, he's writing to the same person as mentioned in Luke, and he's referring to his first narrative, and his first narrative is about the life of Jesus, which pretty well describes Luke. So there's very little argument in scholarly circles that Luke and Acts are not written by the same person. It's obvious that they are the same person writing the book. In fact, it's part one and part two. Uh, so that's the first point to look at. Second thing to look at on considering Luke as the writer, whoever wrote Luke is not an eyewitness to the events he writes about in Luke, but is an eyewitness to at least some of the things in the book of Acts. And that'll become evident in, in, in the next point. Thirdly, the author of both Luke and Acts, uh, especially uh, Acts, was someone that traveled with Paul. It was someone who was with some of the missionary journeys that Paul went on. We know this because of what's called the we statements, W-E, the we statements. Let me just show you some. You're already in, in Acts. Let me just show you a couple of them real quick. There are several, but I just want to uh, uh, show a couple of them. Acts 16. Look at Acts 16. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Acts 16, verse 10. So Acts doesn't tell us who wrote Acts. It doesn't say in the beginning. Luke wrote it. But li listen to what it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 10. After he had seen the vision, we, so whoever wrote Acts is, is on this trip with Paul, we immediately made efforts to go to Macedonia and, and, and so forth. Uh, another example of it is chapter 20. Chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. Chapter 20, verse 5 and 6 says, These men went on ahead and waited for us in Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread. In five days, we reached them at Troas. We, wore, we, we spent seven days with them. So again, there's these we statements that's throughout the book of Acts. So whoever uh, wrote Acts is on some of these missionary trips with Paul. Now, with that in mind, we can go through Paul's studies, his letters, and we can go through Acts, and we can see who Paul says was with him on some of these trips. And if you do that, what you find, the very first person you'll find is that Mark was with Paul on some of his trips. So you could say, well, maybe Mark is the writer of the book of Luke. The only problem with that is Mark has already written a biography about Jesus, and it's it's agreed upon among scholars that Mark is the first biography of Jesus. He writes it first. There would be no reason for him to turn around a few decades later and write another one if he's already wrote one. So really, Mark doesn't make good sense. Some of the other people mentioned, they're just kind of unknown. We don't know much about them. They're just mentioned in passing, and that's, that's it. You can go through a list, and there ends up being names like Timothy and Titus and Silas and Barnabas and some others that we're not so familiar with. And you can come up, once you take Mark out of the list, you come up with eight possible names that traveled with Paul and therefore could have written Acts. And if they, if they wrote Acts, they wrote Luke as well. And that's where we have to defer to the early church. And, and it's not unusual for us to refer to the early church to help us understand who wrote certain books in the Bible. Because the early church, they were closer to the actual events than we are and they stand a better chance of understanding what tradition had and what was legend. And so as early as 170 to 180 A.D., we have one of the first canonizations of Scripture. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying 
It, it, the word cannon means a measuring stick. It was a measuring stick that was used to determine what books should be in our Bible. That's what the canon means, what books should be in our Bible. By 170 to 180 A.D., so 150 years after Jesus ascended into heaven, that gives you kind of a, a general idea. We have a canon that says that Luke and Acts were written by Dr. Luke, actually refers to him as Luke the doctor. And so as early as 150 years of Jesus' ascension into heaven, and within about 120 years of when Luke was probably written, we have the documentation that it was written by Luke the physician. And so most scholars have not argued that since then, for the exception of the Jesus Seminar, and that's a whole other study in and of itself. The Jesus Seminar was a, was a set-up quack to begin with. It, there's no legitimacy to it at all. So what do we know about Luke? Well, it appears about the character of Luke that he was not a Jew. His knowledge of the Old Testament and his discussion of god fears, especially in the book of Acts, shows that he was Though he wasn't a Jew, he was what, what was called a God-fearer. In other words, he, he was following God, was interested in God when he became a Christ follower. So he had a background knowing Jews and being around Jews, but he wasn't a Jew himself. According to Colossians 4, verse 14, he was a physician. He was a doctor. I mention that to you because we just came off of Christmas, and there are two of the biographies of Jesus that have the virgin birth account. Matthew, who is a tax collector, and Luke, who is a physician. Now, I can understand how a tax collector could get it wrong. I mean, who trusts the IRS? Nobody does. So you can understand how they could get it wrong. But you would think of all the people that would understand biology, a doctor would understand it. And yet it is Dr. Luke that records the, that Mary was a virgin when she conceived Jesus and gave birth to Jesus. So I, I think that's an important note. All four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are all different enough that we can see that they're independent documents, that they're just not copies of, of the same thing. But also they're similar in their stories that we know they're talking about the same person. It's obvious in all four that the key person is Jesus and that the key events in Jesus' life are the same, especially the crucifixion and the resurrection, which is recorded in all four. But Luke is unique in some of his information. There are some parables that are only in Luke, and Luke focuses a lot on how discipleship affects how we live among our neighbors. Even when our neighbors are going to be uh, persecuting us, how we live among our neighbors. You know, there's the great parable of the Good Samaritan. That's found in the book of Luke. It's a great example of how Luke writes. He, he kind of writes for the underdog. The Samaritans were underdogs, and he kind of writes for the underdogs and how the underdog becomes the hero. And really, the book of Luke is, is, the, is the primary gospel that says that Jesus Christ is for everybody. You don't have to be just Jewish. You don't have to have a Jewish background. Luke didn't have a Jewish background. And the gospel is available for everyone. So uh, it's believed that Luke is the writer uh, of the book. The second question to ask and answer, I won't spend near as much time on this one, is when was the book written? Well, some people argue that the book was written after the destruction of the temple. We know historically the, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D., so some people argue it was written after that in the mid-'80s. I don't believe that's the case because, for example, in Luke 19, Luke is recording Jesus' words, and he's talking as if the destruction is going to come in the future, not something that's already happened. So I, I don't believe that Luke wrote it after the destruction, I believe he, he writes it before the destruction of the temple. Also, when we understand that Luke wrote the book of Acts as well, we have a pretty good idea on when Acts was written because we know it was written before Paul was martyred, before Paul was killed. And Paul was killed about 64 AD. And we know that Acts was written before that because if you read the book of Acts, 
The last half is all about Paul. Paul is the main character of the last half of, half of the book of Acts. And if you read the end of Acts, there's no indication that Paul is dead. I mean, it just leaves him in Rome. That's where the book of Acts ends, is that Paul's in Rome. Now, if he's the main character of the book of Acts and he's dead, if he's been martyred, surely the writer of Acts would have put that in the last of his book. He would have said that this guy died, but he doesn't. So it's believed that Paul is still alive when Acts is written, and we know historically that Acts died around 64 A.D. Luke was obviously written before the book of Acts, so somewhere between 60 and 62 A.D. is when the book of, of Luke was written. And I mention that to you because the, Rome, the, the Rome, Roman and Jewish skirmish is starting to build. Historically, the tension between the, Romes, between the Romans and the Jews is building to the point that there's going to be a massacre and the temple is going to be destroyed in 70 AD. So that's starting to brew about this time. Third question to ask and answer, who was it written to? So who was the book of Luke written to? Well, it's written to Jews, but really, as far as the Jews are concerned, it's, it talks about how they have rejected the Messiah and they are going to be rejected. It's written to Gentiles, and it's showing that they are included in this new, new kingdom. At least it's new to them. They didn't realize they were included in, in it. So how they're included in God's kingdom. And the book of Luke uses parables like the Good Samaritan and other parables to show how God includes everybody in his kingdom. And, and then Acts, which is the, the sequel to the book of Luke, it shows uh, Peter going to non-Jews. And it shows Paul, his, all of his missionary journeys are to non-Jews. So Luke is really our, our best gospel for people like us who aren't Jews. Because it, it, it introduces Acts, which is all about going to, to a non, non-Jewish people. Uh, so uh, that's, who, that's who it's written to. It, specifically, it's written to a person, Theophilus, who's mentioned in both Luke and in Acts. We don't know anything about him. It appears he was probably some prominent person in, 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 in that culture there. But other than that, we don't know anything about him. He had some exposure to the faith because it seems that he is needing some reassurance of what he's believing in and who he's believing in. And that's why Luke writes the letter or the book is he's writing him to reassure him that you're believing in the right thing and you're believing in the right person. And then Acts, he writes that to give him kind of an update on what this, the way, which is Christianity, what Christianity is doing. But then when you read the book of Luke, it's obvious that he's not writing just to a person, that he's, he knows other people are going to read it because in just some of the terms he uses, it's obviously broader than just one person. And so obviously the answer is eventually he's writing it to everybody. It's Theophilus first, but eventually he's even writing it to us. That leads me to the fourth question, what is the purpose of the book? You know, in Sunday school class when you're, you were a kid or if you teach Sunday school now and you ask any question, you know what the answer always is. But Jesus, well, the, the answer to this question is, you know, what's the purpose of the book? Well, the purpose of the book is Jesus, I mean, that, that's the purpose of it. The, the, it's, it's the nature of God's work of deliverance through the person, Jesus Christ. And that you can trust the basis of that information that it's reliable. So that's why he starts off in Luke 1, verses 1 through 4, and he gives this background of where he's getting this information from and how he's writing in a logical sequence He's writing a dependable bit of information so you can know who you're believing in and that it's trustworthy. So it's, it's, it's about Jesus. Uh, Theopolis was probably a, non, a non-Jew, and he probably wondered how in the world did he get caught up in a religion that is primarily, at that time, it was primarily among Jews. And that it's, founder is a Jew. How in the world did he, a non-Jew, get wrapped up in this Jewish religion 
which may be one of the main themes that Luke writes is he shows him that this new religion, this belief, this Christianity is not, it's not Judaism. It's different. It's for all people, and maybe that's why he invites Theopolis to read that. The Jewish leadership would end up rejecting Jesus, and Jesus' followers, like Theopolis and like us, needed to know that they might reject us as well, just as they rejected our founder. Luke, therefore, is a very practical gospel. If we were to study the gospel of John, we would see that John is the most theological of the four gospels. Mark is the quick overview. It's like almost like Mark is writing in a hurry, and he writes it really quick, and it's just the shortest one because he's trying to get the information out as fast as he can. John is this deep theologian. Matthew is more of an eyewitness account. He, he sees a lot of the stuff that's going on. Luke is more writing. He's a theologian, but he's more writing like a historian and a pastor trying to encourage Theopolis and people like us. That leads me to the last question, why should we read the book of Luke? Of course, the answer would be it's in the Bible, but let me give you five other reasons why to read the book of Luke. One, it is the foundation for the church movement that is in Acts. Not to go into too much about the periods and the ages that we are in, but we today are in the church age. In other words, God is still working through the church. We're not in the Old Testament age. We're not in the age in which Jesus was on the earth and, and the time in which the Messiah was on the earth. We're in the age of Acts. We're in the church age. And so if we're going to understand the book of Acts, we've got to understand the book of Luke because it's, it's, it's book one of book two, and we're in that church age. Secondly, the, the book of Luke answers the question, if, if anyone can respond to Jesus, he's, he's the center of God's plan for salvation, and can anyone respond to that? Thirdly, we should read the book of Luke. Though Luke kind of gradually reveals who Jesus is, it's like a great mystery novel as he begins to unfold who Jesus is. Uh, Every section of the book challenges us to respond to Jesus. Now, you could say that about every, every book in the Bible, but Luke in particular, every section challenges us to respond to who Jesus is. We're going to see that Sunday. We're going to study this, the account of Jesus in the temple. He's 12 years old. How in the world could a 12-year-old challenge you? And we're going to see Sunday that Jesus in the temple challenges us. We saw it. A few Sundays ago, between the character Simeon and Anna and how an eight-day-old Jesus challenged people with his authority. What are you going to do with this Jesus? Every paragraph in the book of Luke challenges us, what are you going to do with Jesus? So that's why we need to read it. Fourth reason why we, why we need to read the book of Luke. Luke teaches us not only that Jesus died for our sins, but also he died and was raised to form a people of God who by a renewed spirit are able to serve him in righteousness and holiness. It's a real emphasis on practical daily living, righteousness and holiness. And the fifth reason to read the book of Luke, of all four biographies of Jesus, Luke most fully presents that Jesus came to include all nations, and not just all nations, all types of people from all these nations, including people like us. I want to encourage you sometime in January, and you can do this, okay? This is the Wednesday night crowd. Y'all are smarter than the Sunday morning people, okay? I want to encourage you to read the book of Luke. Sometime, sometime between now and February 1, read the book of Luke. It would be good if you could read it in one setting, and that's probably going to take you a couple hours. You might not be able to do that. But at least, you know, take a few Saturdays and, and get it read and, and read the whole book of Luke because we're going to be in it off and on the whole year and that'd just be a good base for you to, to read that book. Uh, especially read the first uh, four uh, chapters. That'll get you ready for the series we're in right now.